Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club, to tonight's book break. My name is Christoph Neidhardt, and uh, tonight we don't have a special guest, but a special speaker, Anthony Rowley, with his book, Who Will Pay to Save the Planet? The $100 trillion question. Anthony, of course, does not need any introduction here. He's a former president of the club. He's a former member of the board. He's a current member of the board. When I joined the FCCJ many, many years ago, Anthony was one of the first whose name I knew because at almost every press conference, Anthony was the first to ask, ask a question. And usually when we were told that there's only one question, Anthony managed to ask one and a half questions. <laughs> I always perceived Anthony as very, very British. British and a bit old style. If you say, and at the same time, very, very worldly. If you read the invitation for tonight, it says, Anthony worked on the times. Not at the times or for the times or maybe with the times. No, on the times. <laughs> Graham Greene also worked on the Times. <laughs> but nowadays, hardly anybody does, except for Anthony Rowley. And he didn't only work on the Times, he also worked on the Far Eastern Economic Review in Hong Kong. At that time, I, I think until about 15 or 20 years ago, by far the best publication covering East, uh, Eastern Asia. And Anthony was there in uh, several different editors and uh, reporters' functions. So Anthony is a really seasoned financial journalist. From time to time, I meet one of my friends who is a financial journalist too. And he tells me he had again been to some IMF meeting or World Bank meeting somewhere in the world. And then he says, oh, and I saw Anthony Rowley. Uh, if you would like to know a bit more about Anthony, you have to go to the archive and dig in the old uh, uh, number one Shimbun. Once upon a time, Anthony wrote there a nice piece how he got to Asia first. He was embedded with some British military, the, the Queen's uh, um, armed forces, I assume, yeah. in British, in colonial Britain, meaning Malaysia, and uh, he had to, uh, he, he brought along, he was sent by his editor, I don't think you knew so much about Asia before, and uh, he wrote in that piece that he brought along three suits, but he never used these suits, of course, it was far <laughs> too, too warm, that brings us back to climate change. Um, by the way, that story is very self-deprecating, and, and on the continent, you would say, that's British humor. Uh, climate change is real, of course, and it's man-made. This finally has become common knowledge, except for a good part of the Republican Party in the US. <laughs> Technically, the world might be able uh, to, and have the tools to stop climate change, the climate catastrophe, as I we should say, or at least the ability to develop these tools. Electricity can be generated by solar or wind and has become much cheaper than oil. But not much is done. And as Anthony writes in his book, and no one is in charge of what has to be done. Uh, some countries, in, including Japan, are still building coal power plants. Some people here might think they buy a Tesla or a Toyota Mirai, a, a hydrogen car, and shares of Tesla and solar power companies and mutual, mutual funds to save the climate that will save the climate. That's far from enough. In some cases, Anthony thinks that's fuzzy or even eye, or eye washing. I don't think you use the word eye washing, but green, that's, green washing. that's the meaning. Uh, Anthony, Anthony tells us these financial institutions that make money with climate change funds often uh, cheat on us. He doesn't use the word cheat. but In his book, uh, 
Anthony asks the most obvious question of our time, probably the most important question. But the question has hard, that has hardly been asked seriously so far. Who is going to pay for the tran transition of the planet to sustainability, a transition that could be done? And Anthony doesn't only ask the questions, he has an idea in how, what direction it should go. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent introduction. I feel I should be talking about my experiences in Borneo rather than <laughs> saving the planet. Okay, well, um, thank you all for coming, sincerely. Uh, here is the book, and um, I hope you'll agree that uh, the, the, the cover photograph, at least, is interesting. <laughs> it's quite dramatic. I was quite pleased with that. Um, it's a rather slim volume, as you can see, but that, quite honestly, is because it's a soft cover edition, and the publisher has crammed an awful lot of words and lines into each page. Uh, you know, such are the exigencies of publishing nowadays. It's interesting because my last book on infrastructure before this was considerably fatter, but it had fewer words. But it's by having so many words crammed together, it's come out very very short, but even so, those of you who buy it, I hope you'll still find it reasonable value. And I must apologize right away for the fact that I've only got two copies with me tonight. Uh, there's a further consignment um, on its way from New York, where the book was published by Nova Science Publishers, and these should be available shortly at the front desk. Um, if any of you would like to buy the book, please give me your name or business card, uh, later, and I'll make sure that enough copies are available at the front desk in coming days, and I'll happily sign them if you wish. Um, now I come to a rather embarrassing point, which is that the cost of the book is, I'm afraid, $82 a copy. Now, that's obviously not cheap, but I'm afraid I have no control over pricing. The publisher uh, has informed me that I can offer a 40% discount, 40% on any copies sold this evening, which would mean a price of just short of 50 US dollars or 7,000 yen at current exchange rates. So I, I wish to make that um, point at the outset. Okay, well, let's turn to what the book has to say. Um, and let me, you know, obviously make clear what's obvious, I think, at the outset, that I don't claim to be a climate science expert. I'm a journalist and a writer. The subject is, is a huge one, and there have been very many books written on it already. Um, my book does, you know, does provide a broad brush outline of what has led up to uh, the climate change crisis, and I think it is a crisis, the dimensions of that crisis and how it might possibly be resolved. But I think maybe what distinguishes this book from others is its specific focus on how much it's going to cost the world to fight cl climate change and who's going to pay. Um, here I think I can claim some expertise because I've been an economic and financial commentator for 50 years now, and I've spent the past two or three of these years delving into how climate, uh, the battle against climate change is supposed to be financed. Um, as a matter of interest, this came about almost by accident when I was asked a couple of years ago to write a book or a compilation of interviews on the subject of sustainable investment to be published um, by the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, and Asia Asset Management Magazine in Hong Kong. So I set to work doing that. And as I researched the subject, I talked to international organizations and ex experts on climate. I, I quickly began to form the impression that the, the numbers just didn't add up when it came to the prospective cost of the battle against climate warming global warming, and the financial resources that need to be committed to that end. So after I'd finished that book, um, uh, I set to work on writing this book. And what was clear to me from the start was that the bill is going to be huge, and it's going to have to be met by you and me uh, and all of our fellow citizens as taxpayers, company shareholders, consumers, or whatever. Hence the title of the book, Who Will Pay to Save the Planet? The $100 trillion question. 
So you might ask, how did I arrive at the figure of 100 trillion? Well, it's an average of what various expert assessments so far have suggested will be needed in total over the next couple of decades or so. And if anything, it is on the, on the low side. Just very quickly, um, Deloitte, the consultants Deloitte, estimated the cost, the needed um, money, the funds involved would need to be 170, 170 trillion dollars uh, between now and 2050. The International Energy Agency, the IEA, puts the figure um, at 100 trillion by 2050. And a group which you may have heard of called the GFANS, which is the uh, Global uh, fin Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which was formed last year, puts the figure at $100 trillion to $130 trillion. So you can see a sort of ballpark around $100 trillion. And just as uh, for comparison, according to uh, the OECD, the amount that's actually going into uh, climate change financing at the moment is roughly $630 billion a year. So that amounts to just $18, $18 trillion by 2050, not 180 trillion, 18 trillion. Um, what you will see, I think, is the, uh, is the often quoted and very much smaller figure of $100 billion, which is the amount that the key advanced nations in the United Nations have pledged um, a dozen years ago to provide annually to less wealthy nations by the year 220 to help them adapt to climate change. Yet even this much smaller figure of 100 billion has yet to be achieved. Obviously, there's a huge discrepancy by a factor of 100 times, in fact, between 100 billion and 100 trillion, if I've got my arithmetic right. And my book argues that this is typical of the, what I would call the fuzziness which surrounds the climate change issue when it comes to deciding who does what, how much it's going to cost, and who's going to pay. Uh, obviously, the cost of dealing with devastating floods and rising sea levels is going to be overwhelming in places like the Maldives, Bangladesh, or Pakistan. And we all read about that frequently in the papers. But it's going to be huge, too, in rich countries, such as Belgium or Germany or others in Europe, um, which recently have suffered very serious flooding, which has been unprecedented. And forest fires, droughts, crop disasters are just as real in the United States or Europe or Australia as they are in Latin America and Africa. Yet the cost of dealing with these multi-trillion dollar catastrophes doesn't seem to have gained anything like the attention that the often quoted figure of 100 billion for developing countries has. Maybe this is because development economists have given the climate issue more attention than many mainstream economists in the leading nations have. Okay, well, as the opening paragraph in the book says, and I quote, until recently, until quite recently, most people were either in the dark or in denial about climate change. And even though that the impact is showing up dramatically in so-called natural disasters, which in fact are largely man-made disasters, such as typhoons, hurricanes, forest fires, floods, rising sea levels, and so on. The world remains dangerously divided over what action to take and largely ignorant as to what the cost of that action will be. The critical issue the book suggests is, quotes, of who will pay for a climate change rescue operation. Um, it's long been neglected, and now that it is finally coming into focus, it's obvious that the deficit of finance is matched only by a deficit of clear thinking, on how to marshal and deploy the funds that are needed to go from what's called a brown economy to a green economy. I'd like to quote what Prince Charles, then Prince Charles, now King Charles III, of course, said at the so-called COP26 Global Climate Summit in Glasgow last November. He said, quotes, we know this is going, will take trillions, not billions of dollars. Climate change and loss of biodiversity pose a great threat, and the world must go onto a warlike footing to combat it. I thought that was a good choice of words, actually. Uh, but in fact, the world has not gone onto a war footing because the world is too divided economically and ideologically. 
to do so. Instead, the world is at war with itself, I would say, but we'll come back to that later. Uh, the estimates, as I said, for financing a planetary rescue vary very widely, as I guess you might expect given the sheer scale of the operation. But as I said, there's a rough consensus that the cost will be of the order of $100 trillion at least, and maybe much more over the coming two to three decades. For, for comparison, that's roughly equal to one year's annual GDP, global GDP. I can provide more details, details of these estimates uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you like later, but as I said, they come from sources ranging from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, to the International Energy Agency, and from individual investment banks and consultants to the consortium of leading financial institutions known as the GFANS. Okay, well, the next obvious question is, what is all this money needed for? Uh, I suppose a narrow definition would include things like the cost of replacing or modifying multiple thousands of fossil fuel power plants that every day belch carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions into the atmosphere and replacing them with power plants using renewable sources of energy such as wind, water and solar power or of reintroducing nuclear power on a much larger scale than at present. Let me just say briefly, when I mention nuclear, that one of the chapters of this book is devoted to nuclear, as it's the nuclear revival. It's a very important subject at the moment, and this chapter was written by Mr. Grady Loy, who is a chemist and uh, is here with us online tonight. And so if you have any questions specifically on the nuclear contribution to climate change, um, then I will hand them over to Grady. Uh, so um, th there's going to be a huge number of what are called stranded assets uh, created in the process of cleaning of the power sector, uh, which is obviously a major contributor to the carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions that cause global warming. And as the, the head of sustainable investment at the Institute of International Finance in Washington, a lady called Sonia Gibbs, said in this very room uh, some months ago at a deep dive event we had, she said, we cannot simply turn out the lights on coal or oil and other fossil fuel power stations in which hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested and which have years or decades to go before their cost has been fully depreciated or amortized. I think people tend to overlook that point sometimes. And one estimate published by the Bank of England several years ago suggested that the cost of dealing with these stranded assets could run into trillions or even tens of trillions of dollars. So a very hefty sum of money. As the book also points out, uh, automobiles especially face a heavy cost in going electric, while households will need to grapple with the cost of clean and green heating and air conditioning. These costs are going to fall disproportionately upon different sectors of the economy. To give you some idea, 25% of greenhouse gas emissions are caused by electric power generation, 21% by industrial processes, 25% by agricultural production, and 14% by transport activities and the rest by other sectors. And also countless you know, industrial installations ranging from steel making blast furnaces to cement plants and myriad others will need to be replaced or modified. And also the cost of capturing carbon emissions at source and storing them underground. That's something on which Grady Loy can also speak is going to be very hefty. So um, as the IMF has said, climate change will quotes, strain public finances for at least a generation to come, in other words, for 25 years. Obviously, they're going to strain corporate finances too. Uh, I think perhaps one small example might be that of Nippon Steel, which, is, as you know, is one of the biggest steel makers in the world, which, uh, according to Bloomberg, has recently asked the Japanese government for 2 trillion yen, or $17 billion of state funds, by way of subsidies to help it um, cope with you know, climate change or ameliorating climate change. Bloomberg described this development as a, a sign of what governments worldwide face in the future as they commit their industries 
to strict net zero targets. Um, a broader definition of um, where the money is needed, obviously, too, must, you've got to take into account the very severe impact that it will have on physical infrastructure, health and social services and so on. Almost any day now we can pick up a newspaper and read about forest fires that devastate vast tracts of land and displace communities, floods that do the same, rising sea levels that inundate coastal areas, rivers that burst their banks, scorching sun that buckles railway lines and highways and creates health crises. So adapting basic infrastructure design and you know, also in, uh, adapting the infrastructure that already exists um, to cope with climate change will add trillions of dollars over time in the Asia-Pacific area alone, as the Asian Development Bank, for one, has observed. And the impact of climate change on agriculture and fisheries is becoming dire and can only get worse from here on. Uh, there's also the potential cost, not easy to estimate, but very real, nevertheless, of lost industrial output and other economic activity that is going to come about as a result of climate change. There are also costs which I think most of us don't even want to think about, but which um, some people have begun to focus on, and one relates to so-called solar, solar geoengineering. In other words, measures to dim the sun, or at least reduce its impact on Earth's atmosphere. This is very controversial, but there's an organization in Paris called the Paris Peace Forum, which is headed by Pascal Lamy, a former head of the World Trade Organization, which is looking actively into this question of dimming the sun, so that if we can't solve the problem, you know, at least we can dim the sun. But that, of course, might have catastrophic effects on agriculture and all sorts of other things. So, you know, to repeat, someone is going to have to bear the cost of all this damage, and it's going to be a heavy cost. So who will pay? Well, China is the biggest single emitter of carbon dioxide emissions nowadays. It accounts for 31% of total global emissions. That was in the year 220. And the world's top five biggest polluters, China, the United States, India, the Russian Federation, and Japan, were collectively responsible for some 60% of global CO2 emissions in 2020. I have got th uh, s just three quick charts, if I can access them here. Um, I made a new little oh, sisters with this. Thing. We have a probably a rain. He's coming. Ah, on the back of the Next one, could you hear that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this one shows annual carbon emissions by region uh, between 1825, 18, the year 1825 and 2018. You can see that the problem only began to become a problem after the year 1950, before that emissions were really negligible. But if you look at this also, you'll see, at least I hope you can see it if I can, Move this. It's, uh, it's fine. It's fine there. Look. Yeah, but I can't see the I can't see the names of the countries you from. Can't, uh, I think the bottom one is China. I think which is the lowest one is Europe. The, the lowest one is the Europe. Green one is China. The green, green one, one is, is China. China. So you see, Europe did peak, um, but has come down somewhat. The top one is the USA, right? This one here. The no, pink one. The yellow is USA. Yellow is USA. Oh, yellow is USA. So, so sorry. Okay, well, that also is a major contributor, but has more or less stabilized in the past um, few decades. And then the green is China. China. And there, of course, you can see that China's emissions have risen hugely. And then the others are the rest of Asia. And the pink one is what? Other Asia. Other Asia. Other Asia. So uh, other Asia, as you can see, you know, if you put China together with the rest of Asia, you can see it's a very major contributor to global emissions. Okay.
Um, this one is uh, per capita emissions, and I think the US, it's really very difficult that I can't say. The US is by far the biggest per capita mm -hmm. emitter, followed by Europe. Europe. Yes. And then China. And then China, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's just one more of these charts. Okay. Now, this is interesting. This shows the share of cumulative carbon emissions by region since the year 1850. So, this is. Uh, blue is Europe. Europe. Blue is Europe. So, you can see Europe is, has been by far the biggest contributor to global emissions, uh, which is not surprising since the industrial revolution began in Britain and, and Europe. And this again the is... Green is the US. And the US, yes, yes, the US has somewhat reduced its emissions, but it's still a major contributor. Okay. Well, the, the point is that um, some people might say that, well, you know, countries like China, since they are the people who are pumping out most of the emissions now in India should bear the lion's share of uh, combating the impact of global warming. But, you know, the picture looks very different if you view it from a total stock rather than an annual flow perspective. In other words, um, while China for, uh, nowadays emits the highest levels of CO2 annually, it's emitted far less than the United States over the past century or more. And so the task the world faces now is cleaning up the mess that has accumulated <laughs> in the atmosphere, um, the carbon dioxide, and it can't just all be shoveled onto those countries which are um, uh, the, 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 the highest emitters at present. In fact, China actively argues why you had your industrial revolutions, you, you created an enormous amount of carbon dioxide emissions, when we want to do the same thing, you say it's not on, you can't do that, uh, but why, why, can't, why, why don't we have the freedom? That's a very rather crude way of putting it, because, of course, China is one of the most active countries now in combating climate change. But this argument is quite often heard, um, that the uh, major emerging economies uh, should bear far more of the cost. Okay, well, global warming, you know, as its name implies is a, a global phenomenon. No one country, no single country or even group of countries can hope to deal with this problem alone. And as such, my book argues that a global climate authority, we, perhaps let's call it a GCA for, for short, is needed. It's not necessary to have a world government in order to, start to do this. Um, to establish a global climate authority. It could take the form of a multilateral agency, such as the World Bank or the IMF, with expanded powers to coordinate national climate actions and to access more funds that would find their way directly, and I emphasize that word directly, into climate-related projects and help finance the battle against global warming. If, you, if such an organization did exist and if it was properly funded and staffed, a global agency, I think, now by now could have assessed the full dimensions of the climate, climate crisis and drawn up plans for how best to tackle it, how much a planetary rescue operation will cost, where the funding might come from, and what other resources are needed apart from finance in the climate battle. The United Nations, of course, does undertake some of these tasks, as do other agencies like the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD, the International Energy Agency, and so on. But no single body exists with an approach focused specifically on climate change. And some have called for a new Marshall Plan or even a Moonshot Initiative, similar to what um, Kennedy launched back in the 1970s, I think, to um, get man on the moon. But my point is that, you know, that there's been no global initiative of this kind in what is very much a very urgent and clearly global problem. Instead, I think we've seen a series of, you know, rather half-hearted initiatives taken at national or international level. And all this reflects the unwillingness of governments to come to grips fully with the problem and to accept that a global approach is needed or indeed to give up the sovereignty that they, they perceive is necessary so that a global climate agency can <coughs> operate, excuse me, 
and well, I, I, nations obviously can claim sovereignty in some areas, but climate change is not one of them. We all sink or swim together in this regard, and at present, our swimming is not even synchronised. A report published earlier this year by the Deloitte Centre for Sustainable Progress suggested that, quotes, unchecked, climate change could cost the global economy 178, 178 trillion over the next 50 years unless global leaders unite in a systemic net zero transition. Well, as things stand at the moment, as, as I'm, I'm sure all of you know, the primary vehicle for coordinating climate change is what is known for short as the UNFCC, or United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was introduced in 1992 as a first step towards addressing climate change on a collective basis. Nearly 200 countries have since ratified this convention and have pledged to avoid dangerous human interference with the Earth's climate system. And three years after that convention was adopted, these same countries adopted what was known as the Kyoto Protocol here in Japan, in Kyoto, which, quotes, legally binds developing country parties to carbon emission reduction targets. But, you know, as to how binding these commitments really are in practice is a matter, I think, of conjecture, uh, given the lack of a formal body beyond perhaps the International Court of Justice at The Hague to sanction any country that breaches what are, in any case, voluntarily offered targets. Excuse me. But in any case, the climate battle is not, or should not be, just about governments setting targets. It needs to be about economy-wide plans involving governments, state agencies, private corporations, savings and other financial institutions, and so on preferably, or I would say essentially, at the international level. Okay, well, let's suppose for a moment that the estimates of what of Operation Climate Rescue is going to cost are roughly in the right ballpark, although I think that's a rather heroic assumption because, as I said, the consensus figure of around 100 trillion almost certainly errs on the low side, especially as now we're going to entering, going to what looks likely to be an extended era of inflation. So the question then is, where is the money going to come from? Well, we can hardly blame people in general for not thinking too seriously about this problem. Even as far back as the 1970s, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, for one, had been drawing attention to, quotes, strange weather patterns, unquotes. Not even most governments at that time were taking the climate change threat very seriously. Indeed, many people who did were regarded as cranks. Um, mm. And, of course, you know, energy lobbies, so-called big oil, although I uh, big so-called, sorry, but big coal, <laughs> big coal is the real black villain, as I call it, of the, uh, because coal is a far bigger contributor to global CO2 emissions um, than is oil. And, of course, its use in China is huge, and it's growing, if anything. Um, so, I mean, this is, of course, this is a very distressing aspect of the present situation whereby uh, the world is desperate for energy and we're having to bring back on stream certain coal-fired plants, um, stepping up oil um, use, um, all of which goes directly against the, um, against the, uh, uh, the, the target of cutting um, CO2 emissions. But what do we do? You know, we economics takes precedence over anything else in this situation, or politics does anyway. Uh, and also, you know, a climate change uh, crisis was believed by many people to be something way into the future. You know, it was something we worried about um, 30 or 40 years down the road, and um, our children maybe were, would suffer from it. But, but of course, you know, it's becoming very clear every day. You only have to look at the weather now or watch television and see the disasters that are occurring. Or even here in Tokyo in the past few days, we've had a, a three-day typhoon uh, and very strange weather. So it's much closer than um, we thought it was going to be. And, you know, we were also kind of assured that if we grew enough trees and stopped cutting down forests, all would be well. And I like the comment made 
to me, actually, by Lord David Howell, who's a former UK energy minister and nowadays a climate activist member of the Britain's House of Lords. He said, we can talk about greening until we're blue in the face, but that won't solve the problem of the world's over-dependence on fossil fuels. What will solve the problem, or at least slow down climate change, pending the advent of new technologies, um, is the early closure of power plants that belch CO2 into the atmosphere. But that's going to cost a lot of money. And that brings us back to the issue of where the money is going to come from. Uh, David Howell, Lord Howell, again, has you know, said that uh, really the coal and oil are on-rolling monsters and uh, the emissions from these are going to continue rising um, rather than falling. I think many of us don't realise that, but it is a sobering fact that uh, as things stand at the moment, the situation will get worse before it gets better. Okay, well, you know, something called a livable environment is what economists would call a public good. Uh, and so it might appear that governments should foot the bill for climate change, prevention and amelioration. Governments globally do collect some 17 trillion, 17 trillion a year in taxes, according to the OEC data. And that sounds like a handy sum of money for dealing with climate change. But of course, most of that revenue is already spoken for, for to cover general government expenditures and debt service, very rapidly rising on government borrowing. Also, governments are already borrowed up to the hilt and with interest rates rising uh, now, further borrowing is not really an option to cover climate change costs. Whatever the cost, the advocates of modern monetary theory or M MMT, which some people also say also stands for magic money tree, uh, say about the ability to governments to go on printing money indefinitely as long as they have internationally acceptable currencies. Governments can always raise taxes, of course, but that hardly seems like a good idea now when the global economy is teetering on the brink of recession. But what about all the money in private savings and investment? Isn't there plenty there to pay for the climate change bill, you might ask? Well, there is indeed several hundred trillion dollars there, but again, most of it is already spoken for. In a recent blog, uh, the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, and her director of monetary and capital markets, Tobias Adrian, suggested that there is, quotes, some $210 trillion in financial assets across firms, or roughly twice the gross domestic product of the entire world. Okay, I, I should also add myself that separate estimates by the United Nations and the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank, have put this figure at between 270 and $300 trillion of, of assets under management or um, savings that are available. Obviously a very useful sum of money, but as uh, Georgi Ava and, and Adrian again suggested, and I quote again, the challenge for policymakers and investors is how to direct a bigger share of these holdings to climate mitigation and adaptation projects. And this really is a very big challenge. A large part of the, the financial holdings they referred to are under the control of either rather conservative bankers or asset managers and institutional investors who in recent years have preferred to inflate a bubble in so-called tech stocks rather than focusing on long-term investment in climate change or infrastructure or healthcare. So what about ESG? This is a very, very widely used term nowadays. It means environment, social and governance investing. And some of you will be asking why have I forgotten that? Well, no, I haven't. Uh, you know, is, is that the answer to all our prayers and to the climate change problems? This is indeed is how many people have come to see ESG, judging from the huge amounts of money it has attracted, which estimates range anything from 4 trillion yen to 30 trillion yen, depending on how you define it. The ESG movement or initiative was launched back in 2004 by the United Nations under this scheme, which was devised by the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Some of the world's biggest companies were urged to incorporate environmental, social and governance considerations 
into their corporate vision and strategy. This was certainly a worthy motive, um, whereby companies agreed to rather nebulous criteria in the con conduct of their business, instead of focusing only on the bottom line. By doing so, they, they were led to believe they could win plaudits, uh, praise for social consciousness, and maybe enhanced standing among shareholders with a consequent boost to their stock market ratings. And likewise, financial institutions focusing on ESG criteria in their investment portfolios could hope to gain standing in the eyes of investors and among the public at large. But aside from the fact that the auditing of ESG standards and compliance relies mainly on private rating agencies and industry associations rather than on official regulatory bodies to lend credibility. The ESG movement is far from representing a frontal assault on the problem of climate change. Just as when you invest in so-called green bonds in the belief that your money is going into a green project, when it is, in fact, sometimes being diverted to other projects under a practice known as greenwashing. And in the same way, the money which your bank or broker will urge you to invest in ESG investments is not guaranteed to end up in climate saving or other environmental projects. One um, member of this club who is a financier, I won't mention his name, said to me that, Anthony, ESG is all about broker's commissions. <laughs> And I think that's a very interesting point. Okay, well, according to some estimates, the total size of ESG investment has reached $35 trillion in 2021. And Bloomberg has estimated that it'll be more than $50 trillion, $50 trillion by 2025. But this is very much a matter of definition, depending on what is classified as ESG or sustainable investment. Financial services agency Morningstar, for example, estimated the size of funds focused on ESG-related issues to be a much more conservative $4 trillion, not $35 trillion, as of September last year. Uh, and, you know, ESG investment goals are often flexible to the point of being almost meaningless, which, of course, is the polar opposite of the very directed and focused approach that I argue, is needed in combating climate change. If you wish to ex invest, for example, in actions that directly impact climate change and help the planet, you may not be so keen on seeing your money diluted by investment in firms that put more emphasis on social, other social considerations or governance issues than they do on preserving the environment. And a lot of this applies to, to what are called the 17 Sustainable Investment Goals, or SDGs. They were announced by the United Nations in the year 2015. Uh, but only one of those 17 goals relates specifically to climate change, although admittedly some of them do contribute indirectly to, to um, mitigating climate, uh, global warming. The SDGs, as their name implies, are no more than goals to which it's hoped that public and private development efforts will be directed. They're far from being mandatory or measurable targets or having an institutional structure through which, the financial, through which financial and other resources can be directed and projects implemented. Sorry, I'm just checking the time. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Um, Okay, so uh, let's turn to COP26. The battle, you know, the battle against climate change seemed to take on a more tangible form at the time of the COP26 Global Climate Summit in Glasgow last year with the launch of what was called the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, or GFAMS, which is co-chaired by former Bank of England Governor and now United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Change, Mark Carney, with Michael Bloomberg acting as co-chair. This private sector-led group of more than 450 major firms and private financial institutions from 40 different countries around the world describes itself as a, quote, global coalition of leading financial institutions in the United Nations race to zero. And by the way, the race to zero refers to the fact that some 130 countries have set or are considering a target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to net, net zero by 2050. 
These countries are also included in the 190, so 190 or so countries adopted the Paris Agreement, which was a so-called legally binding treaty on climate change reached at COP21 in 2015. Uh, which the Paris Agreement, of course, aimed to keep the rise in global temperatures to below 2 degrees centigrade compared to pre-industrial levels by the end of this century and to, quote, pursue efforts to limit the rise to below 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. And what's interesting, I think, is the G G funds, according to the GFUNDS, over $130 trillion of private capital is committed to net zero. Well, what does that mean? Um, I think there are real caveats against this. Um, and maybe it's so-called commitments are not really worth the paper they're written on. Uh, why is this? Well, the G fund, the basis on which the GFUNDS contrib contributions have to be decided among the parties to the agreement has not yet been spelled out. And it's similarly unclear as to whether the myriad pension fund investors, insurance company uh, holders, policy holders, mutual fund investors and others whose funds have been committed, supposedly, and I quote, to the climate change fight will in fact acquiesce in such use of their money. Okay, so where do we go from here? It's pretty clear that the battle against climate change is far from being decisively won at this point, even if it's not yet been lost. Um, it's also clear the battle cannot be financed either by public and private financing working independently. The real money is in the private sector and yet the real organising abilities in getting climate projects implemented is in the public sector and we have to find better ways of enabling them both to work together and combine their resources. And one way in which this might be achieved, at least in part, is by making better use of the multilateral development banks, such as the World Bank and the regional development banks and so on. These are, you know, these are remarkable institutions, and yet they're underused. As my book suggests, if they didn't already exist, we'd need to invent them. The book devotes a whole chapter to the MDBs, as they're known. They have the ability to raise huge amounts of loan capital at relatively low rates of interest on international capital markets, and to deploy these funds in long-term investment projects, which is exactly what the battle against climate change needs. They also have formidable organizational resources in the form of specialized international staff who are well qualified to conceive and coordinate climate change projects on a global scale. And again, that's just what's needed. These banks have huge leveraging power or the ability to get a bigger bang for their buck because a relatively small increase in government capital contributions enables them to raise much <coughs> larger sums in capital markets. By the way, I'm not alone in this idea. People ranging from World Bank former chief economist Joe Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz to Larry Fink, who's you know, head of BlackRock Financial Group, have expressed very similar views in very recent times. Quickly... One of the few examples of such collaboration that does exist is what the Asian Development Bank in Manila calls its Energy Transition Mechanism, or ETM, which aims to help developing countries in Asia that are among the world's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases to shut down coal-fired power plants within a limited time frame ahead of schedule and to replace the lost output with renewable energy. And the partners in this scheme include some of the largest, world's largest financial institutions. It draws on both public and private finance at market rates and, in, uh, and concessional rates, even grant finance. And this is just the kind of new thinking that I think is, is needed in order to make the idea of public and private cooperation into a workable reality. Um, the IMF's Georgi Eva has also suggested that by taking equity positions in climate investments, the public sector could bear much of the investment risk, but would see great benefits when the investments succeed. Okay, I'm now coming towards the end of my presentation. So, as this book concludes, at the end of the day, finding acceptable solutions to the climate change challenge will demand compromise at the political level, so that the burden of global warming mitigation and adaptation can be shared in an equitable fashion. And this in turn implies the need for in new institutions or restructured and strengthened existing ones with a global mandate to plan 
or coordinate as well as finance climate actions. And to me, it suggests that financial markets will need to uh, work closely with the public sector uh, in order to ensure the effective distribution and monitoring of climate funds. In other words, you might say it will require a form of quasi-state capitalism capable of collecting and deploying savings on the massive scale that's required. Okay, well, who knows? It may be the sheer, or one might say terrifying, scale of the climate change threat, and it's an ex existential threat if ever there was one, may be a factor that brings us all together, <laughs> brings the, war, the world together and helps us to overcome the political and ideological divides that are pushing us towards self-destruction. The next COP meeting, the UN Conference of the Parties on Climate Change, COP27, is due to be held in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt in November, a few months away. And I think it's going to need to be much more specific on the issue of who will pay to save the planet and how the rescue can be better organised if the meeting is going to have any credibility. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, but um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anthony. Uh, I mean, you uh, somehow answer your own question, or you complain that nobody's in charge the international monetary institutions would should take the lead in your in your view that's how i understand, understood your book uh, actually when before i forgot to tell you that you actually encouraged and you know what encouraged means in japan encouraged to wear a mask when you don't drink or eat uh, sorry about that uh, we come now to the question and answer. Um, please come to the microphone, introduce yourself, and uh, since this is not a press conference, you are entitled to have an opinion uh, before you uh, ask a question, but please no long speeches. Who is first? Yes, please. Eugene, Eugene yes, Eugene Singh. Could you, could you introduce yourself just okay. simply? Uh, my name is uh, Xin Yuqing. I'm a professor of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Study located in Lubangi. Uh, very glad to be here today and uh, very happy to see your new book. Uh, you're so productive. <laughs> uh, <coughs> my question is very simple. From your picture, you showed that China's carbon emission actually is the highest, exceeded the US and uh, European country as a whole, and continue uh, to grow. Uh, because Chinese government just said, you know, like a gross will be zero by 2030. Uh, I have a, you know, like a question, like a, how we should look at uh, China's carbon emission, because China is so-called a uh, water factory, and the Chinese company basically, uh, you know, uh, function uh, as a manufacturing uh, factory, uh, which uh, uh, led by. A multinational company, for example, you know, like all the iPod products assembled in China, parts, some parts made in China, and the most of Nike shoe and Uniqlo t-shirt. So it basically means, you know, like a Chinese uh, a company, a part of a global value chain mm. led by multinational company in US and European country. So US and European countries, they specialize in so-called, you know, like a research development, branding, right. retail. So those kind of uh, we call task definitely is a low carbon emission, is service oriented. But in order to uh, achieve the value of their intangible asset, brand, design, software, they need China's activity. Mm. So should we think the emission in China, you know, the emission in China uh, is the only responsibility of Chinese factory or Chinese people? Or should, because your, your book is who should pay, right? Yeah. Should we think yeah. this multinational company which benefit from China's uh, you know, factory activity should pay? Because uh, if you look at who captures the highest of the value, it's a multinational company who capture most of value. Yeah. It's China who share most of blame and the burden. Yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> okay, yes. that's all. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a valid, it's a valid point, and I think it reinforces my point that there is no... 
you know, a global climate agency at which these issues could be discussed. I mean, it's a valid point, I think. And um, China is indeed the workshop of the world or the factory of the world nowadays. And as such, it's bound to, uh, you know, it, it's home to industrial processes which are high emitting. So, um, and yet we impose much um, tighter standards on China than during the Industrial Revolution in Britain or in Europe or in America were imposed at that time. Um, I, I, obviously, I, I don't have any ready answer for that. I mean, climate, the, the question of um, carbon taxes is becoming very... I, I didn't mention this during my talk now. One point is that, you know, carbon tax, if it's sufficiently high, could offset an awful lot of the cost of um, fighting climate change. But at the moment, carbon taxes are very low, um, very low indeed compared to what they need to be, and relatively few countries have adopted them. They're quite hard to administer, but not impossible. Um, so that might be one way in which the burden could be shared. But I, I think, as I said, your your question really illustrates the lack of a truly global approach on this. There's no way... You can't do this at the United Nations, for instance. You can't do it maybe in, within the OECD. There's some discussion on it. But um, there's there's a lack of... Um, uh, uh, of a forum where um, the, all the countries are concerned. It's not only China. Some of the smaller countries too that have become industrialised have the same complaint. India has the same complaint to some extent. Um, it's very real, uh, th these concerns. And I wish I could give you a more precise answer. My only answer is that, uh, is that it's going to finally put more pressure on the leaders of the, of the United States, maybe China, maybe R Russia, maybe others, India, to um, agree to some form of climate agency which has the power to listen to these arguments and to legislate. And also the question of carbon taxes is going to be very important, at the level at which those are imposed. They're imposed at different levels all over the world at the moment. Um, so it, you've raised a very interesting point. Um, I don't think I can add much to what I've said. Sorry, I hope that answers your point, but it certainly reinforces the point about the need for global coordination. Um, you know, as I say, we have the United Nations that uh, concerns itself mainly with asking governments to come up with voluntary targets. But the question is monitoring these targets and making sure they're actually implemented um, and there you need specialists, you need, you need uh, legions of specialists, and they need to be under some common... I asked um, Sonia Gibbs, the head of um, climate change at the Institute of International Finance, who was in charge, and she said, Anthony, that's, in this room, that's the best question I've ever heard. No one is really in charge of this, and yet it's such a critical issue. Um, and it's going to re it's going to involve some sacrifice of sovereignty, and that's better done, I think, by investing in an agency. After all, the the World Bank and the multilateral development institutions do operate with quite an amount of autonomy, not complete autonomy. But you can have a model whereby an international agency, a multilateral agency, is given a certain amount of um, devolved power to um, work out solutions on these things. Any other questions? Next question, please. Yes, please. Oh, sure. Uh, Obayas is my name, uh, freelance. Uh, just one simple question. Uh, regarding the uh, future of the, our planet, our planet, are you in, in a conclusion, conclusion, are you optimistic or uh, pessimistic or no? Sorry, I didn't quite... Are I'm you optimistic or pessimistic oh. for the future of the climate? Of what? For the future Regarding of the climate, are you optimistic or future. pessimistic? Well, how can I be optimistic? I mean, as I, <laughs> as I said, you know, things at the moment are getting worse. I didn't, you don't need me to tell you that you only have to watch television every day to see that uh, and if the pace of progress was keeping pace but it's not well, A, um, there is not enough coordination B, the financial 
question is very fuzzy still. How are we going to combine this money, collect the money, channel it? I mean, I think this is a tremendous... Um, the, I've got experts here who may disagree with me, but challenge for um, young people because, you know, we have to work out new ways... So, well, so much money goes into stocks and shares at the moment, in stock markets, and they've become grossly inflated in recent times. And new ways have to be found of channeling stock market investments, for example, into long-term investments. Um, and I think there are many ways in which that could be done, but I won't go into detail now. But um, I know I'm not optimistic. I'm not optimistic at all. Uh, I think it will require a much more serious crisis when heaven knows what will happen, you know. The, the, I mean, it is said that if the, uh, the sea under the Arctic Ocean is, in fact, if, if the ice in the Arctic is melting at the rates some people think, you know, uh, sea levels might rise by tens of metres. Tokyo might be underwater before <laughs> too long. Now, that will make people think, you know, nothing... If we were attacked by Martians, we would all come together. <laughs> we would agree on a solution. But if anything, you know, and because of the rivalry between China and America and China, Russia and so on, if anything, the world seems to be becoming more divided and more focused on uh, aggression and on conflict than it is on climate change. I mean, I would argue this is the most important issue that we face. And yet that doesn't seem to be getting into people's consciousness. And that's one reason why I, I, the publisher wanted to put a rather innocuous picture of some nice little plant on the front. And I said, no, it's got to be, it's got to be a forest fire. It's got to be something that makes people say, ah, oh, yes, OK. Um, um, maybe television should be doing more on this, including television in Japan, showing more films and, and getting people to answer these questions in very simple terms. Are you optimistic? Yes, you are. Why? No, you're not. Why? I mean, it, it's not being brought home to the public because there's, there's so many dimensions to this, and it's not made simple enough, I think. It's not simplified. A lot of the... I don't want to criticise other journalists, but they simply, you know, repeat a lot of the sort of received wisdom. And uh, what I've tried to do here, and I mean, there are lots of faults with this book, but I've tried to say, well, there's... There's a basic problem here which we're not facing. <laughs> so, no, I'm not optimistic. I'm sorry. Joan. Yes, Joan. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> what time? It's uh, 8.30. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, Joan Anderson, Associate Member with Soccer Gakai. So thank you, Anthony. I just want to say thank you. I was in Glasgow last year at yeah. COP, and... Um, you know, a lot of what you're saying echoes what was being felt by a lot of the civil society participants. Mm. Of course, huge levels of frustration. Um, but I guess my question is, well, I have many questions, but um, to focus on one, mm. you're, you mentioned young people. Yeah. And yesterday, <coughs> I was involved in a planning discussion for COP27 in Egypt. Yeah. And young people in Africa, for yeah. instance, are asking, because even if finances are allocated, yeah. they're going to go to governments. So how can we find ways? Because the people who are going to suffer the most are the poor. They're already suffering terribly. So how can we find innovative ways to enable funding maybe to go from, I don't know, people to people? Because if it gets stuck in developing country governments, this is also not going to be the answer. So that's my one question out of many. But thank you so much. Well, um, I mean, the way in which most of us, I think, if you're worried about the climate and you, you want to put money into helping, you probably go to your banker or your broker and they'll say, well, I've got just what you need here, an ESG fund, please invest in it. And by the way, I'll take 7% commission. Um, you know, and you happily buy this thing uh, under the misapprehension that you're directly putting money into climate change um, fighting, which you're not. But when I talked about a challenge for young people, what I, I suppose I didn't make clear was that 
you know, uh, we have some marvelous brains in the financial sector, at least we're led to believe we do, um, and they devised all sorts of fancy exotic uh, financial instruments like subprime mortgages and, and derivatives and all kinds of things. Let's give them a more positive challenge. Bring some whiz kids into, into finance and say, no, devise something which will channel savings, and there are a lot of savings in the world, more effectively into fighting climate change. And I'm sure they'd come up with all sorts of astonishing products which you or I could invest in and where we would know that our money was going more directly either into you know, saving forests or, or whatever. Um, so, uh, I mean, young people... Well, young people obviously have protested and things like that, and but there's a limit to what protests can do, quite honestly. There's been a lot, and yet it's still we have these problems. Um, so again, I guess we have to find ways in which young people can help more directly. Maybe they need to lobby more. They need to get out on the streets and lobby more their politicians and say, are you really getting to grips with this problem? How are you doing it? Show us how, what you're doing. Uh, or surround the Houses of Parliament or Kokai Gijito or whatever and say, you know, we want some, we want to know what's happening to our money. I mean, uh, I, I, but I think the primary aim is through the financial system um, because there is just so much funding there. And of course, it's, most of it is already invested, although in places like Japan, there's huge sums of household savings that are not, except are we led to believe they're under mattresses and so on. Um, so, you know, it needs to be a financial sector revolution, I think, which, uh, well, it's, it's, it's getting underway. But there's the time element that's the problem. We don't have the luxury of time. If we had decades and decades to think about this, fine, but we don't. I mean, I don't know whether the events of the, this year, for example, are really typical. If they are, I'm terrified because it means that we're going to be seeing climate change manifestations are becoming worse and worse and worse, in which case it may be too late to do anything, um, unless we um, block the sun. Um, and th this, there is a, a passage in the book that refers to this group in Paris called the, uh, um, the Paris Peace Forum, which is led by Pascal Lamin, has a number of ex-prime ministers, and, and they are looking at real contingency, real emergency contingencies. What if it is too late now? To, and what if we do have to block the sun by injecting chemicals into the atmosphere and so on. What impact will it have on agriculture, livestock and so on? Um, I think that, that, needs, that needs to be better known, I think. Yeah, okay. Next question, please. Yes, good. What time do we finish? 8.30. Yeah. We have 10 more minutes. I'm fine, I'm fine now. Uh, no, it's okay. Oh, yeah, the microphone's coming to you. <laughs> well, my, na <coughs> my name is Kutsi, but I'm an associate member here. I mean, you have a fantastic uh, pre um, presentation here. Uh, I will send you my comments in writing on, on 10 different uh, uh, problems. But uh, I'd like to raise just three now, uh, which um, are really coming out of your presentation. Okay. The, 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 the first one is uh, the, uh, the, the, the global authority. Yeah. I mean, before we here in Japan uh, talk about global authority, it would be a good thing to have, you know, you, that is that better. It would be a good thing to have a, glo a, a global uh, Instead of a global, a, a Japan, a Japan authority to handle it, uh, because um, as long as as Meti is going to be in charge, <laughs> it is a complete uh, conflict of interest going day by day, and what one part is doing in the direction we want to, the other half, the other half is to stop and make sure that the. Uh, the projects are not going through. I mean, uh, I'm receiving a, a, mon a weekly report on that, and it's unbelievable what is going on in Japan week by week. 
If uh, you're interested, I'll be quite happy to give you the whole file. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, that, that, that was that one, yes. So, this, uh, so I said, the, the authority met it. Uh, the, the second point is, yeah, uh, you were talking about carbon tax. Yeah. Just to give you, uh, well, no, to give everybody the idea, what is the carbon tax in Japan and what is the carbon tax which is uh, generally required to, be, to get any results in the rest of the world. Yeah. In Japan, I think it's $2.6 per, yeah. uh, per ton. Yeah. Per ton. Yeah. Uh, the, the rest of the world thinks it should be something oh, between 80 point. and yeah. $100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yes, yes, okay. you have very little, li little uh, feeling that, that uh, you, you, should go, uh, you should go away with your, with your coal. Yeah. But, uh, but um, the, the, the third point I had is, yeah. um, uh, we started about everything. In other words, uh, as you pointed out, we should have started at the at the uh, with with the coal to do the real coal stuff, yeah. coal yeah. problems, and not try to f to f to fight with the whole world on all different uh, uh, um, sorts of of uh, of energy, yeah. uh, and make make animals of uh, enemies of them everywhere. Yes. Uh, so that yeah. uh, that um, that in my opinion is. It's a, it was a kind, a, a, a nice Boy Scout okay. start. Say, okay, yeah, we do 46% in 20 so and so and, and so and so much in 2050 and so okay. without have, having really any clear uh, possibility of, of uh, bringing this into okay. um, operation. Okay. Uh, can I? Uh, okay, I, that's, I, that is one that's more, uh, the, sorry. That are the three points I wanted to okay. raise now. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Grady Loy, are you still there? Yes, can you hear uh, me? Yes, I'll come to you in just one minute. Okay, well, on the first point, uh, if I understood you properly, I mean, you, even in Japan itself, there's no uh, common agreement among ministries and so on on the strategy to be followed. Well... I suppose you might go from there and say, if you can't get agreement, even in Japan, what hope do you have of getting agreement internationally? It's a fair point, but um, uh, I think uh, this depends very much on the political leaders and how much uh, they are prepared to throw their weight behind this and knock heads together, as it were. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not a very satisfactory answer, but it's all I have time for at the moment. On the carbon tax, that's a very interesting point. Uh, as you suggested, I mean, I, I understand that the average of carbon tax amount is around $3 per tonne. And uh, according, to the, uh, according to the OECD, I think it needs to be $73 a tonne in order to raise meaningful amounts of money in order to tackle this problem. So it's... It's a good idea, but it's still at a, an initial stage, and there's a lot of work to be done on that. Um, and then your final point, sorry, was on the... Um, uh, coal. Oh, coal, coal. Well, co coal, I think, has been let off rather light, lightly. People talk about big oil and what a villain big oil is, but coal is really more, as I say, I call it the black villain in my book. Um, Coal, of course, is the, the, the chief villains are in China and Russia, and the United States is also a very major. But somehow the uh, the coal producers, they're less obvious than, you know, ExxonMobil, or they, they don't have such well-known names internationally. And somehow they, they've stayed below the parapet, and they haven't attracted the uh, criticism they need to attract. Um Sorry, those are very brief answers, but I'll, I'm happily come. But I wanted just Grady Loy has been sitting there patiently through the, this whole. Does anyone have a question on nuclear nuclear power? I want. 
on the Japan nuclear? No, specifically on because Grady is sitting there waiting for questions on nuclear. So if anyone, okay, yeah, um, okay, um, Keldon. Sorry, Keldon raised his hand first. I think so. Grady, this is a question from Keldon. Thank uh, yeah. you very much for this. Oh, Mr. Issue. Calhoun, a famous uh, reporter from Pan Orient. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. Thank you. Aldo Azari, Pan Orient News. I have actually two questions, very small one. First one, it seems that the core problem is not uh, the money or how to find the money or how to spend the money, who pays the money. It's the lifestyle of the people and companies and the will of uh, governments. Do they have really will? It seems the governments are interested mostly in wars and economy and uh, elections. So uh, people also, lifestyle is really based on consumption mercilessly. Mm. If, you, if you like go to any supermarket, you have so many glasses, uh, paper, cartoons, everything. Just for like 50 yen, you, you have that big box of paper, which is almost half tree. So this lifestyle has nothing to do with the government. It's just people. And the plastic it's used is hugely. So yeah. do you think the, the problem should be tackled by this, uh, by attacking the lifestyle or other uh, way around? Yeah, yeah. And secondly, for, for Grady, uh, the, the, the big argument is, is really the nuclear power a solution to reduce the emissions? We don't know yet. They say it's dangerous. How can we get rid of the spent fuel? That's a serious problem. Spent fuel, so yes, yes. what yeah. is your uh, okay. solution? Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Carolyn. Okay, great. I'm going to hand the question first to you. You know, what is the contribution that nuclear can make and how do we deal with the spent fuel problem, which is a very real problem? If okay, well, the, f the first problem is uh, w most of us who are interested in the climate field go start on the basis of we would like to go entirely by sustainable, such as hydropower, solar power being the biggest, and then um, wind power being the second. But we're unable to do so because of, uh, to make a long story short, something called intermittency. In other words, the sun doesn't shine all the time. It doesn't shine in all the right places. There are, there are a lot of engineering problems that simply are impossible right now and are not going to be possible in the next 50 years to solve if we're only going to use... Uh, solar power. However, that being said, solar and wind power can do a, can can perhaps supply a majority of the energy we need during this transition period to carbon zero 2050 or so. Majority of that energy if we supplement the the downtime, the period when we cannot access those energies with some non-carbon emitting energy such as nuclear power. Nuclear power historically has had two or three problems. One, it occasionally is dangerous. In other words, we all saw Fukushima. I trust I don't have to explain how much of a traumatic thing that was. And two, uh, we do have waste that we need to dispose of. And you know, there, there are arguments that the volume of waste, the difficulty in handling it from a number of perspectives, isn't that more of a problem than yeah, yeah. just doing something else. And I, uh, it, interestingly, about 25 years ago, I think it's been, I, I was in the San Francisco area talking to an old schoolmate of mine who had gone on to MIT and, and ultimately became an inventor. And so he was very plugged in with a lot of things at that time. And he was very excitedly telling me about something called new modular uh, reactors. This is back in the 90s. And I said, well, why are they doing that? And he said, if they make them smaller, it's easier to handle. And he said, they're also using new technologies. He said, he said to me, he said, did you know that when you, when you burn nuclear fuel in a conventional multi-billion dollar nuclear plant, you only burn a small amount of it. And then you leave all of this contaminated half burned fuel. Mm -hmm. so in, so in, in other words, for, for a kilogram of fuel, you get a certain amount of energy, but since you don't burn up all of the fuel, you, you know, you're, you're basically throwing away a lot of dirty energy and you're not getting that much power for it. So he said what they had been working on for about probably 20 years before I talked to him was building smaller, more compact reactors that are easier to handle, where we don't end up 
throwing spent fuel rods and, and big water ponds that we can never clean out because they become too radioactive and, and all of these other problems that we've had. We have these units that are like extremely large drums and the entire nuclear reactor is, is included inside it. And that's step one. Step two is that we change some of the heat exchange mechanisms so that we're able to burn the fuel more efficiently and we are able to melt the fuel into the into the medium that is the heat transfer medium. I that's complicated to explain, but mm-hmm. what it means is that we don't get meltdowns to make it to make a long story short. We simply don't get meltdowns. Mm-hmm. And you know the third factor then is that we're we were experimenting with fuels that are different. There's a little bit of what we used to call breeder technology, which sounds very frightening because it sounds like you're making plutonium to make nuclear weapons, but it also includes things like thorium, which is not made into nuclear weapons and which is quite abundant, in fact. And so we, we actually have, in the private sector, we've had companies now for 20 years. I mean, Bill Gates is the most famous, uh, but he's not even the largest, that have been working on these models. And Gates has, fo- has been focusing just just as because he's the poster boy for this. He's focused mm-hmm. on reducing um, more complete consumption of fuel using fuels that can be completely consumed, smaller area, media that don't melt down, all of these positive things. So that basically, to, to make a long story short, you get a safe reactor that is compact and you can throw it away. It's much less radioactive at the end of a period of time. And this has okay. all been all right. under development for the past 30 years. And, and Gates has been with the conscious eye to attacking this intermittency problem in the sustainable energy yeah. portfolio has been developing this. He was developing it with China. China, because of the Trump regime, was cut off from co-development about five or six years ago. But... He's still developing it with Korea and India and several other major nations. I think Japan might even be included in the consortium. Yeah. They're they're targeting getting their uh, their modules out within the next ten years. Yeah. Other less desirable. I mean, others that are more like the present day technology that we don't really like that well, but they're but they're still modular and small, so they're a little yeah. better. Are are scheduled to come out within the next two or three years. Yeah. And in fact, there's a Russian model that's out right now on a ship going up and down the Russian coast, providing <laughs> uh, power where it's needed. Yeah. So this is this is something that's happening kind of yeah. as we speak. Yeah. Okay. Now, interestingly, and and I'll try to close up here because yeah. I know you don't have all the time in the world. The U.S. Department of Energy has now come out with a statement in the last two days, saying some some bright young person has said. Oh, let's close down these coal plants, you know, like Lord Howe was talking about. Yeah. And let's put these nuclear modular reactors in them, uh. which is great. Now, there are still technical issues on the side of the nuclear modules. I mean, mm. they're, they're, these small nuclear modules we're talking about, these reactors, there are 60 kinds of them being, being uh, developed by uh, companies literally all over the world. They've, they've invested yes, hundreds yes, yes. of billions, possibly trillions of dollars into this. And they're okay. going to come, but governments are going to have to sit down. And this is where your your multi multilateral financial institutions have to come in. Somebody's going to have to sit down and vet these and decide which ones are too dangerous, which ones are the best, yeah. which ones, and so on. And I'll okay. stop with that because I okay. think I've said quite a lot. That's that's very interesting, especially the point about uh, these plants being more fuel efficient, and therefore you don't, as I took it, have the same waste problem. Okay, um, Cal. Oh, has he gone? Oh, there. <laughs> I should have Sorry, mentioned... Sorry, Caldon. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Grady. Um, your point about changes in human behaviour, very, very important. I mean, obviously we have all got to, you know, reduce the amount of fuel we consume and perhaps the amount of food we consume and so on. Um, this is coming into, into more... Um, and nowadays it's it's a consideration that's looming larger I think people are not so much now saying okay we, we need enough energy to go on consuming as much as we want for as long as we want they are beginning to question whether we do need to change our lifestyles in order to adapt with the climate um, 
I want to go on, but I think I think. Let's see. There is one last question, I one think, and then okay, we close. Sorry, yes, please. Please. Yes, please. Go ahead. Yes, yes. It's yes. Harko Watanabe. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for uh, briefing about uh, international institutions' concern about uh, weather change. Japanese people are rather naive about weather. Until we have three days typhoon, <laughs> people are not interested in saving uh, weather or saving uh, energy, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, although you mentioned uh, international institutions' concern, about keeping this earth safe. Do you have any idea of uh, NGOs, Japanese NGO working for this uh, purpose? Or which governmental ah. institution are very much interested in this kind of uh, uh, agenda? Okay. Uh, so far, Japanese mass media has yes. not mentioned about, yes. does not give a big page on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Haruka. It's a very good question. And in fact, we did have a deep dive event, what we call a deep dive event, a few weeks ago, in which we had several specialists from the United Nations University and what was the name of the organization, Joan? The um, IGES. IGES, the international, uh, anyway, a specialized institution. There is indeed work going on. And what I will do, I did write a piece in the number one Shimbun about this, but there is work going on in Japan and um, so, you know, the Japanese contribution is, is, is very much there. Um, can I send you some material on this? Because it, uh, it was very interesting. And also, as Joan knows, uh, one of her speakers, who was a, um, a clergyman, uh, you know, did, did raise this point about human responsibility and how we have to change our lifestyles. It was an interesting event, specifically on climate change. Uh, which which we had in this room some weeks ago. I I, I want to go on, but I, I fear this room has to be cleared. By exactly. Uh, so, Morimaki san, can we go on? Or if that, uh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> okay. we, so, before we uh, give uh, Anthony a big hand as a token of our appreciation, because you already Ooh. are a. Me uh, oh. a mem probably even a free member as a former president. <laughs> There's a bottle of wine, and then I want to announce uh, next uh, week's book break. We already come back next Wednesday evening with a book by Yunshin Hong. Uh, she does a book about how comfort stations on Okinawa are remembered. So it's about comfort women, but it's not about the comfort women problem, but how this is uh, seeped, this has seeped into the Okinawa psyche. I think it's, it's very interesting. So now please give Anthony a big hand for tonight. Thank you very much indeed. And Grady, thank you for your contribution too. Many thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.